uh, is run completely on Middle Eastern issues. Uh, I think, you know, objectively we can say that from the Cyprus issue to the Caucasus, from the Balkans to Central Asia, of course, Turkey's uh, EU membership process, <coughs> uh, there is a wide range of issues in Turkish foreign policy, it's not just uh, the Middle East or the Muslim world, but the Middle East and the Muslim world uh, are playing an important role in the further expansion of Turkish foreign policy uh, outlook. Uh, first of all, um, the, the policy of engagement uh, is now or has become now a key principle of Turkish foreign policy. Uh, that is, you have to engage everyone in, the, uh, in your environment. Uh, you cannot just talk to uh, your good guys, you have to talk to the difficult actors as well. Um, this line of argument was developed um, in the, with the previous administration, which uh, uh, did not really lead to any uh, workable cooperation between Washington and Ankara, and we have seen perhaps the most uh, dramatic example of this with the Iraq uh, situation in 2003, when the Turkish parliament rejected the motion to let U.S. troops to use Turkish land uh, for the invasion of Iraq. Uh, that was the first kind of major shock. Or, an, or, well, it was not a shock for us, obviously. <laughs> it was a shock for some people uh, in some capitals of the world. But it was really the first effect, I think, the first sign of, of the things to come in, in the sense of a change. Uh, and then there was the Syrian engagement. It's engaging Syria uh, in the region. Uh, and the, I think the key premise there was that uh, Syria, even though it doesn't have a big army, it doesn't have a big... Uh, population, it doesn't have a strong economy. Politically, Syria plays an extremely significant role in the region, especially for Iraq's security, because of you know the political, ideological connections between the regime in Syria and the old regime uh, in Iraq. And I think we've seen the benefits of this engagement uh, today. Uh, when it started in uh, 2004 and 5, it became kind of more public in 2005. The reaction. Uh, it was very negative uh, that, I mean, how can you engage a country that sponsors terrorism, uh, etc. But now, I, you know, everybody appreciates And now with uh, the Obama administration, uh, there is a very quick normalization of relations between Syria and the United States also. There are other examples, you know, the Hamas visit, you know, famous, and, you know, we can go down. Iran is another example uh, where... This policy of engagement, uh, I think, was implemented uh, with considerable success, and we'll see how the Iranian issue will, uh, will, will, uh, will play out. Uh, the second important uh, principle that uh, has been driving the Turkish foreign policy, uh, as far as regional diplomacy is concerned, uh, is uh, regional interdependence. That is, you improve uh, the level of engagement and cooperation and relationship in the region, uh, with neighboring countries uh, in terms of culture, economy, trade, education, uh, diplomacy, policy, and other issues, uh, so that you create an environment of safety for yourself. Again, this uh, was uh, um, uh, this met with some considerable resistance in the beginning uh, when it was uh, laid out and, and executed. Uh, but I think now, you know, more and more people, both in Europe and the States, uh, understand the significance of this. Uh, one reason uh, is um, every single major issue in which Turkey has been involved over the last you know, five, six years, especially in the Middle East, but also in Caucasus and the Balkans, uh, has also been important uh, to Europe and the United States. Uh, if you make a list of, say, ten uh, key regional issues in the world, to which the United States is either a part or uh, considers to be really important of strategic significance, uh, Turkey is somewhere there. I mean, Turkey will make probably like five, six items of that list uh, in terms of its relationship. As I said, this is simply because of the two invariables that I mentioned at the beginning, that is Turkey's history, but also Turkey's geography. Um, Vis-a-vis -vis the Europeans, the same thing. Uh, you know, every single issue, I, I will say almost the majority of European countries you know, have an interest in the Middle East peace process, and they're actively involved. The European Union is the largest donor to the Palestinian lands for uh, you know, civilian purposes, reconstruction, etc. I think uh, uh, annually they give about 1 billion euros or so to various uh, uh, Palestinian organizations, including the PA, uh, Palestinian Authority. Uh, 
and European Union as an organization is also very much involved uh, in, in, in some of these issues. Therefore, uh, it doesn't really create any conflict. Uh, to the contrary, it just uh, complements what, for example, some European policies are vis-a-vis uh, the Middle East. Therefore, when Turkey engages in some of these uh, you know, regional issues, uh, it, it does so, I think, with, with a view of uh, complementing these uh, this policies in its, uh, in its neighborhood. Now, uh, one last comment um, uh, about, uh, let me end with kind of some socioeconomic or political necessity, is the energy issue. Uh, Turkey is an energy independent country. Uh, we, uh, as you know, import energy from, uh, from Russia, from Iran, from Azerbaijan, from, from sort of many other countries. Uh, so we depend on others for our energy security. But Turkey did something a few months ago, as you all followed, you know, with the Nabucco uh, uh, agreement, uh, something that really put Turkey at the very heart, at the very center of, of world energy security in a sense, you know, all the way from, from Central Asia uh, to Europe, to the Balkans and to Europe, uh, and Caucasus. And uh, only two weeks, I think it was two or three weeks after the signing of the Nabucco Treaty, as you know, uh, Russian Prime Minister Putin came to Turkey and they signed uh, a, a, a plethora of uh, energy deals uh, uh, to, with Russia to, to make sure that we have not only an east-west energy line, but also a north-south. Uh, energy line. Now Turkey is really, in a sense, at the very heart of this, uh, uh, the kind of crossword puzzle, uh, or at the at uh, kind of this maze of, of different paths, you know, crossing through uh, through, Tur through Turkey. Therefore, uh, all these elements, both, uh, I think, identity issues, a sense of uh, uh, confidence, self-confidence, and sense of participating in the new realities of the world, uh, and also political economic necessities. Uh, uh, propel Turkey to uh, have the kind of foreign policy activism and expansion uh, that we have seen uh, over the last few years. And uh, I think in the 21st century, this uh, will probably be the main framework uh, of Turkey's uh, foreign policy interests in the years to come. I want to ask the first question, then we'll open up for um, Q&A from the audience. Um, following the 1979 uh, revolution in Iran, Turkey um, pursued a two-track policy towards Iran, um, using its uh, secular system as a pretext and fearing the export of the revolution. Turkey kept its distance from Iran politically, but at the same time, um, try to develop its economic relations with Iran, especially during the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, and my question is, um, where is Turkey right now? Where do we put Turkish foreign policy on the spectrum? Um, realism being <coughs> one end and idealism on the other end. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I don't want to start with this self-gratifying sentence you have heard so many times that, you know, we have an excellent relationship with Iran for the last 350 years. We never change our borders, but I just said that. Uh, but it is true. I think it does play an important role in terms of confidence building between Turkey and Iran. Now, uh, putting aside Turkey's position now, for a, for a moment, you know, try to put yourself in the shoes of, of, of an Iranian diplomat or Iranian policymaker. From their point of view, They've been under uh, isolation, marginalization for the last 30 years. We're talking about active political isolation for whatever reasons. You know, I'm not uh, discussing or judging the reasons, whether they deserved it or not, whether they cooperated or not, but from their point of view. 1979, the, revolution of, the Islamic Revolution of Iran uh, made Iran suddenly uh, the number one enemy in the eyes of many especially Sunni Arab countries, because they felt the impact of the Iranian revolution. But Iran was already, had a sense of uh, loneliness or isolation even before the Iranian revolution, because Iran is Persian and Shiite. And these elements, again, do play a significant role uh, if, you're, if you're living in the region. And they contributed to that sense of insecurity by trying to maybe through this revolutionary zeal, trying to export the Iranian revolution, which they failed mostly. Uh, 